Hello, and welcome to the Daily Bible Podcast with Trisha and Michelle. We're just two friends reading through the Bible chronologically and encouraging you to do the same. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram, Daily Bible Podcast, or go to our website, dailybiblepodcast.net. We are going through the one year chronological Bible, and we have links for that in our show notes and also at our website. And also check out our community group at Daily Bible Podcast. Um, Just look in Facebook community groups and search for our name. And today we are reading in 2 Samuel. We're not jumping around today. Today is just 2 Samuel chapter 15, 16, and the first 14 verses of chapter 17. So it's a straight read through. It's straight through and it's kind of hard though. So let's yeah, just dig well, in. I, I didn't say easy. I just said it was straight. It was a straight <laughs> read straight. through over lots of like rocks and bushes and I don't That's know. That's true. <laughs> lava, hot lava. Maybe that's it. It was a straight read through through hot lava today. There we go. It was. <laughs> uh, so we've seen David fight so many battles, yet this might be the hardest one, the mm-hmm. first against his own son. So I think this is even harder than Saul because like he wasn't related to Saul. Um, but Absalom, again, was King David's son who killed his brother Ammon. And he plotted now to overthrow his father and become the king of Israel. He was handsome, he was charming, and as he stood at the gates, he would woo the people by acting as a judge and offering them justice and fairness, and he was gradually winning their loyalty. Of course, David didn't know this was happening, which made me think of, like, why? Why didn't anyone tell him that Absalom was at the gates, like, wooing all these people? But after four years, so this is four years of him, I will help you. Um, Absalom asked David for permission to go to Hebron to fulfill a vow, but he instead used it as an opportunity to gather supporters and to declare himself as king. Fearing for his life, David takes off all his loyal followers. They flee Jerusalem and David left no one behind, it said, except for his 10 concubines to look after the palace. Um, those poor women. I'm like, <laughs> okay, we're leaving That's what you. I was thinking too. I was like, everyone else leaves, but they're left behind to take care of the palace. Like, is the mm-hmm. palace that important? I don't think so. Anyway, so Absalom returned to Jerusalem, and as David and his followers fled, they were met with both displays of loyalty and support from individuals. So first, Zadok the priest, Hushai the archite, and Atai the Gaitite. They sent individuals back to Jerusalem. And uh, David sent them as spies to figure out what was happening with Absalom's plans. And as, as these spies are heading back to go keep an eye on Absalom, David and his followers reached the Mount of Olives. I was like, oh, the Mount of, Mount Olives. of Olives. I know I was too. I was like, Ooh. <laughs> so they were weeping and mourning as they fled the city. And then Absalom entered Jerusalem and began to make plans for his reign as king. So as David and his followers traveled, they encountered a man named Ziba, who had been that servant of Mephibosheth. Remember, just a couple days ago, we talked about him, Jonathan's son. And Ziba brings David food and supplies, and David rewards him by giving him all of Saul's property. Um, And then as they continue their journey, David is also met by a man named from named Shimei from Saul's family, and he curses David and throws stones at David and his men, accusing David of being a murderer. So there's like people helping David, people not helping David. Mm-hmm. Um, and David's followers want to kill this Shimei, but David restrains them and tells them to let him curse him if it is God's will. And then back in Jerusalem, Absalom seeks counsel from I don't know how to say his name, Ahithophel, Ahithophel, one of David's former advisors on how to defeat his father's foes. And Ahithophel advises Absalom to publicly sleep with David's concubines to demonstrate his power and authority. And then he tells Absalom to gather a large army and personally lead David, lead them in pursuit of David to catch him off guard. So Absalom does that. He goes and sleeps with all the concubines. Um, and then Absalom seeks an opinion from Hushai the Archite, who secretly is loyal to David and advises Absalom, or advises Absalom to be patient and not attack immediately. He says David is a skilled warrior who will turn the tide of the battle 
if given time to repair. Instead, Hushai suggests that Absalom should gather a massive army army from all over Israel, which will take some time, and then wait for David to make a mistake by coming out to battle him. And Hushai predicts that David's experienced warmers, warriors will be difficult to defeat in a surprise attack, so he wants them to wait. Um, and then Absalom takes Hushai's advice. So this is like the spy games happening. <laughs> the this person is this and uh let me tell you this and this is what you should do so there's a lot going on Uh, intelligence work that is what i felt like today was (laughs) about was some intelligence some really hardcore intelligence work today just felt like yesterday felt dark today felt dark and after reading today i thought well no wonder god didn't want david to build the temple I mean, I I really, and and I remember that, you know, when, when we, when we see those words that God says, I don't want you to build the temple, we see it's because he's been this warrior king. He's been this king that has been battling. And I can't help but think, is it because of these battles too? I mean, Mm -hmm. this was, this was a battle. This was a family battle. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it just, it felt like it was just so dark to have a son. And when we talked through it, this, this is some of the consequences, but to have a son turn on you and then like basically try to form a coup against you. And you have some people who still believe in you and some people who don't, and some of them, some of it is legitimate and some of it isn't. And and it's just, there had to have been so much confusion Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. so many different people's hearts, but especially in David's heart. And, um, it just felt like everything was like spinning out of control, like spinning out of control at a high speed, a really high speed. And, but yet upon some reflection, we still see a man after God's own heart. Everything around him is completely spinning out of control. It's consequences of his own sin. He knows this. This was a curse that Nathan told him would happen. But yet he still is anchored on the rock. I mean, we see that David said to Zadok today, carry the ark of God back into the city. I mean, he's so concerned. Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. He Mm -hmm. still wants to be with God. He knows that his place with God is the only place that he is safe. It's the only place that makes sense in a world that has gone so chaotic. And David goes on to say, but if he says thus, I have no delight in you. Here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. Again, Mm -hmm. we see this man who continues to like, have this incredible faith and know that God could say, I just smite you off the face of the earth. Goodbye, David. He could also say, I welcome you in son. Um, I'm here as your shelter. And so just, you know, we, we see David trust in God. He's not mm-hmm. trusting in the Ark of the covenant. He's, but yet he knows that that's where God is dwelling mm-hmm. right now. And He's willing to let the ark go back to Jerusalem and put his faith in, you Mm -hmm. know, in God's hands. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back. You know, thus, I have no delight in you. He's like saying, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. David continues, like I said, he is in chaos right now. He is swirling with confusion. He continues to be humble and continues to have this chastened spirit that that has been proved time and time again. He knows God's going to deal with him righteously. And and that's okay. God's going to deal with him in the way that God's going to deal with him. And David's like, it's okay. I brought it on myself, but I am continually going back to God for pr- protection. David's submitting to God with an active submission, not a passive one. We saw him be kind of passive in his anger against his son, Amon, um, and but we're not seeing him being passive with mm-hmm. God. We're seeing him being very active with God. And, and so we're just, again, we're seeing a man, a character, as a man who says, God, you are my God. There is no one else besides you. Mm. I love that so much. I love that 
his heart shines through. And even when the guy was cursing him, he's like, let him curse me. Maybe God wants him to curse me. Like he was just able to accept it all and just trust God. Yeah. Yeah. The word of the day is a resolute. The word resolute means admirably pers- purposeful, determined, and unwavering. So Absalom was resolute to take the kingdom from his father. He was working on this for a while. But like you were just saying, Michelle, David was resolute to submit himself to God's will, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And so even in this time of running, David trusted God's will. When David left Zadok and the Levites came along again, and God's like, they're, they're actually out there on the run and they were offering sacrifices, which I think is so cool. It's not just like we're taking this along and we're running like, no, we're going to stop and do those daily sacrifices. Um, and then saying, take it back to the city and leaving it up to God. And I love that he was resolute on whatever God did. David was not praying to keep his kingdom. He wasn't like, hey, help me stay king. He was praying for whatever God thought was best. And then look at where he was. He was at the Mount of Olives. <laughs> he, It says, you know, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. And so thousands of years after David, something else happened at the Mount of Olives. You, it might sound familiar. I went, Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so in the New Testament, Jesus ascends to the Mount of Olives with his disciples after the Last Supper, where he prays and prepares himself for his impending crucifixion. While both David and Jesus go to the Mount of Olives in a state of distress, both of them are like in distress. The nature of their distress is different. David is fleeing from his enemies, uncertain about his future, while Jesus is facing his impending death, but is resolute on his mission to save humanity. Also, Jesus' actions on the Mount of Olives are more intentional and purposeful, whereas David's actions are more reactive to the situation that he finds himself in. Yet even in his reactive running, David is still resolute to accept God's will, whatever it is. Remember, Jesus mm-hmm. says, not your will or not my will, but yours be done. Mm-hmm. And that's actually what David is saying on the Mount of Olives. Like, I don't know. That's a cool application that I've never made before. And when you dig into it, it's like they're both, they're both there humbly saying whatever your will is, God. There is so much foreshadowing um, in David of Christ. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. David did mess up. We're we're not saying and and but Christ was perfect. But there is so much foreshadowing in David. You know, I just I think this is such a beautiful picture of what God can and will do with a heart that longs to please him. And I'm talking about David. I mean, of course Christ too cuz um there was so much ugliness in both instances, so much ugliness and so much darkness, and yet God broke through in an amazing way. But, but I'm going to talk about David for a bit. You know, listen to this. It going back to that that verse that Trisha just shared. Wept as he went up. So as he's going up the Mount of Olives, wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot. These were emblems of mourning. We've already discussed that. David was struck by the greatness of this tragedy for the nation, for his family, and for himself. I mean, it was heavy on him, but it, this wasn't a pity party. This was not a pity party or soreness merely over the consequences of his sin. He is, as one commentary said, he is crushed by his consciousness that his punishment is deserved. He is feeling the weight, the bitter fruit of the sin that filled all his later life with darkness, his courage and his buoyancy has left him. I mean, just, just sit and think about that. That that's pretty heavy. Another commentary went on and said, in light of all the facts, it is almost certain that the tears David shed as he climbed the Mount of Olives were rather those of humiliation and penitence than those of self-centered regret Mm -hmm. for Absalom. There was no excuse, but David carried in his own heart ceaselessly the scent of his sense of his own past sin. I really think that as as we're reading this and as we're reading about his 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 journey up the Mount of Olives, we're seeing that he was a redeemed man. And some would even say that 
that God let David off easy. He deserved the death penalty for adultery and murder. But if God forgave him and spared David that penalty, surely David would do it again. I mean, that's what some people are thinking. Yet what we yeah. see is is uh, those who think this way, they just don't seem to understand how grace and forgiveness work in the heart of a redeemed life. And David's sin, we see that as we're reading through the Psalms. We see that as we're reading today, as we read yesterday, as we read tomorrow, his sin is ever before him. He realizes the gravity of that. It's a strange combination of deep gratitude to God for revealing it and also horror of his forgiven sin. David never did it again. He was, like you said, Tricia, he was resolute in who he in in his his life before God. He was resolute. He held on to that. One commentary even pointed out that both David and Jesus suffered for sin, but Jesus suffered for our sins, mm. and David suffered for his own. And and yet he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. And and that morning before God and that willingness to say, whatever your will is, God. Yes, exactly. And Jesus, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. David didn't know what was coming. He had no idea, but he was will willing to say whatever your will is. I think it's just amazing. So Michelle, would you pray for us about resoluteness and that we would be resolute to follow? the will will of God unwavering to follow the will of God? I would do that. I would do. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how we come to see you more clearly and how today we see you more clearly in just the life of David and how we've seen you work in his life from the time he was a teenager up until now and how he has leaned on you. Maybe not faithfully the entire time, but how he has always turned to you. And, um, and Father, in this, in this march up to um, the Mount of Olives, in this heaviness of weight, of, 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 of sin, of family issues, of darkness, of, of everything, Father, he still turned to you. And Lord, I just pray that if someone is dealing with that today, or even the rest of us, that you would just give us this, this heart of David to be resolute, to continue chasing after you when the world seems so dark and when it seems so heavy out there, that we would still be able to put our stake in the ground and say, God is my rescuer. God is my salvation. Mm -hmm. He has saved me from my sins. He has forgiven me. He has set me on a new path. This new path may be hard, but yet God is there with me. I cannot be shaken. Father, I just pray that we would be resolute today in our our pursuit of you, knowing that you've already pursued us. God, may we continue to run after you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to send you off with some daily encouragement to get into the word and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Again, if you don't have the one-year chronological Bible that we are using, we have links for that Bible in our show notes. You can even find it in the Kindle format. Also in the show notes is a monthly and yearly schedule of the Bible reading plan that we are following. And tomorrow we are reading 2 Samuel 17 verses 15 through 29. Then we'll move over to the Psalms for a bit with Psalm three and also Psalm 63, and then back to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 18, and also 2 Samuel 19 verses 1 through 30. And we will see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye.